uh, it's time for our uh, second speaker or final uh, sort of, oh, so, sorry, fourth speaker and final speaker. It's Terence Odin. He's the Rudd Family uh, Foundation Professor of Finance Group at the Haas School of Business at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, so Professor Odin's work is uh, in behavioral finance has been one of the most influential in the field. He has made numerous important contributions on how psychology interacts with human decision making in finance and I would say in particular over confidence and his regularly comments on, on uh, current affairs as a Wall Street Journal expert panelist and by the way Terry I'm sorry to wake you up this early in the morning I know you're in California so we're extremely happy to have you here and uh, he's gonna work uh, present his work on mediating invest investor attention the screen is yours great um, did the, did my, uh, slides come up? Yeah. Oh, good. All right. I want to talk about, um, mediating investor attention and what I'm interested in here is basically the, so how attention drives the behavior of investors and Second, and then what is it that drives the attention? So uh, the first question, how does attention matter? Well, first of all, we all have limited attention. There's a lot going on and we can only pay attention to so much. Uh, I would guess that many of you have seen the well-known video of uh, young people passing basketball while a gorilla walks across the stage. And before you watch it, you're asked to count how many times one of the um, groups passes the basketball. Many people don't see the person in the gorilla suit. And later they're, uh, they're shocked about that. But it's just a fact, we have a limited amount of attention. So how does that affect investors? Well, Brad Barber and I started thinking about this several years ago and what we thought was, well, there are thousands of stocks to choose from. There's you know, 500 stocks in the S&P 500, four or 5,000 other listed stocks. And then these days, you know, this would apply to all sorts of assets. There are, I think, more ETFs available than there are, are actually stocks that, that you can trade. So we thought, okay, that's a huge search problem for an investor. An individual investor is not going to go through a list of 500 or 5,000 stocks and read about them and say, I like this one best, second best, third best. And we thought, well, probably they're haphazard in the sense that the stock catches the investor's attention. And then investors look at it and say, do I like it or not like it? So preferences enter in, but only after... Um, only a after attention has been the primary filter. So for example, say that Anders and I are both individual investors. We trade uh, stocks, and um, but we have different preferences. Anders is a Graham and Dodd style value investor, and I'm uh, a momentum investor. So on a particular day, a dozen stocks catch our attention. Maybe we read the Wall Street Journal and they're on the front page or something. So we each consider the same dozen stocks and then we make a different choice. You know, Anders buys some stock with sound fundamentals. I buy one that's had you know, positive earning surprises for the last few quarters. But attention determines what our choice set is. So individual investors tend to buy stocks that catch their attention. What about selling? Selling doesn't matter as much. And there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, in the studies that I've done, on average, individual investors don't own very many individual, own very many different stocks, maybe four, five. If you own five stocks and you want to sell something, you can easily consider each of your choices. And in many cases, your decision's going to be driven sort of in a backward looking way. Uh, you'll, you'll sell a winner so as to minimize regret because you feel bad if you sell a loser. Or maybe in December, your, your accountant will call you up and, and, and say you should sell some losers for tax reasons. So attention drives people to buy more than to sell particular stocks. And that means that when a stock grabs individuals' attention, there's an imbalance. There tend to be a lot more buy orders by individuals than uh, 
sell orders. Now, obviously, that gets picked up on the other side of the market by institutions. Uh, attention matters for institutions, but a lot less, and for a few reasons. First of all, it's less asymmetrical. Uh, institutions uh, tend to own a lot of stocks, and thus um, they, there's a big choice set from which they can be selling as well as buying. Uh, some institutions sell short, so the universe from where they can buy and sell is uh, pretty much the same. They also work in teams, they work all day, so they've got a lot more attention to spread around. All right, so what happens um, when a stock grabs the investor's attention? One, the in investor trading volume goes up. Second, it tends to be on the buy side. It's not just that buys and sells go up equally. You see a lot more buy orders than sell orders, and the stock price goes up. How much the stock price goes up is gonna depend on how influential the individual investors in a particular, are in a particular stock. Smaller stocks, less liquid stocks are going to see more of a pricey effect. So um, in the a paper that Brad and I first wrote about that, we used three proxies for investor attention. We used high abnormal trading volume, and the idea was quite simple. If a stock's trading more than usual, people must be paying attention to it. Uh, we used extreme price moves. Uh, so we sorted on, you know, did a stock go down a lot or up a lot the day before? And we say, well, if it went up a lot or down a lot, it's quite likely people are paying attention to it. And then we looked at abnormal news coverage. So we had a little theoretical model at, of the order imbalance, like what, um, how many more buys or basically buys minus sells over buys plus sells? To what extent would tra investors' trades be on the buy side of the market? Uh, as, the, uh, as the abnormal of the trading volume went up. So in our model uh, here from the, um, if you look oh, from the left to the right, we're uh, sorting on trading volume, and the vertical axis is the percentage, or rather the order imbalance. As it goes up, the investors are placing more buys. So that was our theoretical model. We looked at data from three brokerage firms. It was uh, about 60,000 uh, investors at large discount brokerage firm, about 660,000 at a a uh, full service retail firm and another 14,500 at a small firm. And we found that indeed when we sorted stocks on abnormal trading volume on a particular day, you saw that the individual investors were increasingly on the buy side of the market. We went back and used uh, TAC data from the New York Stock Exchange. That's all the uh, trades and quotes. And there are a couple of algorithms for identifying the uh, trades of individual investors and whether those were buyer or seller initiated. And the blue line here is, again, we've sorted from left to right on abnormal trading volume. And the blue line is the order imbalance, buys minus sells over buys plus sells. And it's monotonic and almost linear. As trading volume goes up, individuals are more and more on the buy side of the market. The yellow line is uh, trades, large trades, trades of over $50,000, which uh, at the time were a pretty good indication that those were institutional trades and we don't see the same pattern there. Uh, and this is basically the same graph, but instead of, instead of uh, measuring abnormal trading volume and order and balance on a daily basis, we're doing it on a weekly basis and we see a very similar pattern. Here we have a, a theoretical model of when we sort on the previous day's return. We get a U-shaped pattern. When we look at the uh, brokerage data, especially the large discount brokerage data, which is the blue line, we get a very similar pattern. When we look at the TAC data over uh, from 83 to 2001, uh, we also see that pattern for individuals, for small trades, but not for large trades and similar when we sort on a weekly basis. And finally, when we sort stocks on 
abnormal news coverage, whether it's daily or weekly, we see that the small trades are more and more on the buy side of the market as abnormal news coverage goes up. But that's not true for the large trades. So what gets people's uh, attention? Well, here you could look at this and say, obviously, people are going to uh, look at that box because it's red and that makes it salient. However, in this picture, the black box is salient because what salience is basically standing out from your background. So that when I was first writing about uh, attention, I thought, well, it's going to be salient information that gets people's attention. But over the last few years, I've realized that that's probably not the primary driver. So if you look at this, it's not salient. It's just the only thing on the page. And the same thing there. It's the only thing on the page. I wrote, uh, as part of my dissertation, I had a line where I wrote that investors overweight salient, anecdotal, and extreme information. I think what I really meant was that investors overweight salient, salient, and salient information. But today, I think what I should have written was that invest, the information that investors overweight depends on media coverage, media coverage, and media coverage. And sometimes the media coverage, inf news and information that's salient. Sometimes they choose what to cover based on that it's important. Sometimes they just cover that which is entertaining. That's what sells, uh, sells uh, newspapers and magazines. I uh, gave an inter did an interview many, many uh, years ago for Smart Money Magazine. And I, I went to lunch with the reporter and, the, and uh, we talked and I said, well, these, you know, your readers should just be buying index funds. And he said <laughs> to me quite clearly, he said, a magazine that every month says buy index funds does not sell a lot of copies. Uh, so there are entertaining stories. And then there's entertaining presentations. Sometimes the media takes a story that isn't that entertaining and makes it entertaining. Sometimes the media simply re-reports information that was already out there, either in another uh, you know, in another newspaper or uh, another media, or sometimes newspapers report what they've already reported. There's uh, an interesting, there's several examples of an interesting uh, phenomenon, which is a, a lot, it's very popular today to have lists, like top 10 lists. And top 10 lists are quite interesting because you can look at the difference in the effect on what happens to something that is listed or isn't listed, uh, like 10 and 11. Then there's paid advertising um, and stories promoted by companies. So all of these things are covered in the media. What are the, I know this is small print. The whole point of this is there are a lot of papers uh, written. Um, what do we know about uh, investor attention? Well, there are a lot of papers that show that aggregate trading volume goes um, up with attention. Uh, there are a number of papers that show return reversals, that there's a uh, spike in prices that then reverses. And um, in this presentation, I'm going to be talking more about order imbalance, showing that, again, the individual investors tend to be on the buy side of the market for these attention grabbing events. So I'm going to start off here with one of my um, favorite examples. It's from a paper by Ger Huberman and, and uh, Huberman and Rega, uh, 2001. And they talk about a particular event, or basically two events. There's a company, Entermed, that was doing uh, bio research. And in November of, uh, November 28th of 1997, there was an article in Nature magazine that talked about a promising uh, research for a cure for cancer and that Entermed had some licensing rights. And um, there's a little, oops. Uh, yeah, there was a little 
blip in the price that day. Uh, the Nature article, actually what was in the Nature article, got mentioned on the back pages of the New York Times uh, the same day or the next day. And then on Sunday, May 3rd, 1998, the New York Times published a front page article about Entremed and this research. And there was nothing in this article that hadn't been basically covered already in the um, Nature article. And the, um, on Monday morning, the price of Entremed just spiked. Uh, it went up many times. It dropped back by about half and then sort of slowly went down over the next, uh, next several months. So what was going on with investors at that time? We look at small trades. And so we're looking here at the cumulative net number of uh, small trades, buys minus sells, going back to October of 97. On November 28th, there were actually 15 more buys in the small, buyer-initiated small trades than uh, uh, seller-initiated small trades. But really not much was going on until May 4th. And on May 4th, there were nearly 3,000 more buyer-initiated small trades than uh, seller-initiated small trades. So small investors dramatically got into this, bought this stock. What about large investors? If you look at the very large trades, pretty much also nothing going on until May 4th. Then there's a spike in the price and the large investors just started selling. They looked at this and said, uh-uh, the stock is not worth six times or five times what it was yesterday. Uh, and to some extent, they drove down the price. And if you figure out who made, you can look at this and see over the next several months, who made money and lost money. The individual investors uh, <clears throat> end up sort of holding the bag. So that's what you see here. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, other ways that the media um, influences what investors buy and sell just by what it covers. There's a really a nice study by Engelbert and Parsons where they look at local newspaper coverage. So the coverage of uh, local newspapers, this is during the 1990s, they use a large discount brokerage firm that I was able to obtain many years ago and I shared with them. And what they find is that if an earnings report is mentioned in a local newspaper, the investors in that area are, um, Tra will trade that <clears throat> will trade that stock more, and there's some issue of well, is it endogenous? Does the local newspaper cover that stock because the local investors are interested in it? And they do very, uh, get a very interesting um, approach to dealing with that problem. They look for when there are blizzards that stop the newspaper from being delivered. Obviously, pre-digital times, and that they find that when there's a blizzard that keeps the newspaper from being delivered in a particular um, city, then uh, there's less trading of stocks whose earnings announcements were covered that, um, in, in that day's uh, newspapers. Uh, tension of mutual fund flows. So here's a paper on the category kings. The Wall Street Journal ranked uh, mutual funds and had a list of the top 10. And uh, Keneal and Parr um, do a uh, regression discontinuity here and show that the, this, the vertical axis here is net inflows into these funds. And they show that there's a big difference in the net inflows if you were ranked 10 or if you would have been ranked 11. Uh, there's, I don't know, probably not many of you are familiar with the dartboard uh, uh, contest that was run in the Wall Street Journal from 1988 through uh, the early 2000s. And periodically, the Wall Street Journal would have four experts each, and these experts were like financial advisors, analysts, people in the financial services industry. They would each recommend one stock, and then the uh, editors would throw darts at a board and pick four stocks, and some uh, a couple months later, there'd be a report as to whether the um, experts or the darts had done better. 
uh, turns out that the stocks picked by the experts had a spike in price uh, the next day. It lasted for a week and then started to go down. Um, we looked at around, we looked at the buy sell imbalance of individual investors and you know, large investors ar around these events. And sure enough, individual investors are heavily buying the stocks that got mentioned by the experts. And this was old news. These people would be recommending stocks based on stories that were, this was nothing new. They'd say, oh, I think this is a good stock. You know, I own it, my clients own it. So it was nothing new, but it was, there was always a story involved that got, it was fun to read. The institutions weren't swayed by this. And one good piece of news, the individuals were not swayed by which stocks the darts had picked. Uh, there's a, okay, I'm gonna skip this one. Wall Street Week, TV show that used to cover stocks. And again, you saw a, a spike and it went down. Um, I don't know if this is going to, does this work? Uh, Let's see something, one second. Um, I don't think we can hear the sound. Oh, you don't hear it? Ah, okay, sorry, the sound is half the story. Um, I, I was hoping you would hear the sound. Kramer is ranting. He's going, there's no idea. He has no idea what's going on. So Kramer is a popular TV show. Uh, Kramer is very emotional. And uh, there's a big spike, especially in small stocks when Kramer mentions them and then the stock price goes down. We look at what individual investors are doing. Sure enough, they are on the buy side of the market when Kramer recommends they rush in and buy, uh, they buy for the next couple of days uh, and you know they suffer the loss. Uh, Google, uh, Da Eng Engelbert and Gao show that um, Google search volume predicts higher prices. We take a look at, we sort here on abnormal Google search volume. The blue line is that prices go up, which was in um, Da Engelbert's uh, 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 original paper. And then the red line is individual investor order imbalance. The individuals are buying the stocks and that's, and that coincides with the stocks going up in price. Uh, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip this, which is about institutions, but it's a great paper by my colleague, uh, Anastasia Fadik, and I recommend it. He, and it shows that attention does matter for individuals, for institutions. Finally, the media is changing. And these days, the distinction between what's media and say what's a brokerage firm is changing. And you guys have probably all heard about Robinhood, which has become phenomenally popular in uh, the US, uh, especially this year. We have, a, I've got three slides that are just completely anecdotal. These are examples of something happening. I could put up 90 such slides. We've, we're, I'm writing a paper on this with some colleagues. We've started doing some statistical analysis. The results are robust to statistical analysis. So I'm just putting these up as examples. Uh, this is Kodak. And what you have here is the green line is the price of Kodak. The blue line is the number of Robinhood users who own Kodak. And you can see that there was a big spike in the price of Kodak. The number of Robinhood users went up along with that spike. The price went down and the number of Robinhood users went down a bit, but they basically end up, most, many of those that bought high ended up owning a stock that they had bought for more than uh, it was worth. Uh, this is the same uh, story, but with Hertz, weirdly enough, Hertz was bankrupt, had declared bankruptcy and said they were gonna to try to issue some bonds and uh, the price spiked uh, ever so briefly. Robinhood users bought, bought, and bought. And most of them, uh, you know, at this, this covers a couple of weeks. So a couple of weeks after the spike, the price had dropped 
uh, by two thirds and the Robinhood users were still buying it. Now, why is Robinhood interesting? It's, be it's interesting because these people are getting information at the same platform where they're trading. I actually opened up a Robinhood account just to see how this works. You get out your phone and you can see like, what are the hot stocks today? And you can buy that stock in seconds. I mean, it's just boom, boom, I own it. So this is kind of merging media and the ability to trade. Uh, is it a good or a bad thing? Well, one nice thing is a lot of these people aren't trading a lot of money. You can buy fractional shares. So that's probably on the good side. And it may be getting some people interested in investing. But there are certainly people who are losing more money they can afford. Uh, this one's a little harder to read. It's quite interesting. It's my last uh, slide on this. The red line here is the price of a stock duo. Um, and uh, the green line is the Robinhood users. Duo was doing nothing. And then for reasons, and, and there's a lot of controversy about what the heck happened. The price of duo just spiked one day and then came tumbling down and ostensibly it spiked because all the Robinhood users went from a few Robinhood users to over 15,000 in a matter of hours. And the price went up, it went down, the Robinhood users dropped off, but they had lost a lot of money. But they, these people are actually doing something a lot like herding. They may not be doing it because they know that others are doing it, but they're paying attention to very, very common signals and very immediately. So my last, uh, in conclusion, when we're faced with multifaceted problems or a lot of choices, what we do and don't pay attention to may influence our decisions even more than our beliefs and our preferences. The attention of individual investors is directed by the media and the media is changing. Thank you. Thanks very much, Terry. That was very interesting. Um, I have a question which maybe some people are thinking about uh, relating this to Sweden. So you talk about attention and a lot of this is in the stock market and you can maybe argue that uh, some of these investors are at least moderately financially savvy. Um, there is a discussion which I think will be ongoing in the panel debate about the Swedish pension system where we actually have a, the opposite problem with the inattention. So there were a lot of people doing active choices when you launched the system back in 2000 and then the interest has sort of been declining over time. And uh, what happened was also that a lot of people made an active choice. They actually opted out of the default fund, but then they never changed the portfolio. So there's some kind of inertia uh, going on here. Is that something that uh, do we sort of, is there, is there an amount of financial literacy required in order to engage in financial markets and, and then you can you can uh, think about that 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 uh, it could be a curse in the way that you think you know more than you actually know and and that could be a mechanism that uh, drives these things or do you have any comments about that yeah so i think that i think the same thing is true for attention and overconfidence so i'm talking about how attention can drive excessive trading and influence what you buy in ways that are basically orthogonal to value. Overconfidence drives trading. Overconfidence gives people the courage to act on their ideas even when they shouldn't. The other side of this is inattention and insufficient confidence, which can leave people kind of on the sidelines. Uh, and I, th I think part of what goes on here is Making, making a decision about what to do with your pension is the sort of decision most of us hate to do. And why do we hate to do it? Because we know it's really important. We find, I mean, you know, I know there are many finance professionals, probably all finance professionals on this call. I bet even some of you don't enjoy thinking about, should I be in this fund or that fund? You say, wow, this could make a huge difference in my retirement, but I don't know what to do. And if I do the wrong thing, I'm gonna really regret it. And this decision doesn't have to be made today. I could do this tomorrow or maybe next Sunday. So 
you put it off because you don't know what to do and yet you know it's important. So it's really um, a, a very uncomfortable, uh, uncomfortable decision. And once you've made it, the desire to revisit it is pretty low. And all the more so because now once you've made a decision, if you go back and change that decision and you go the wrong way, you're going to experience a lot of regret because you actively went back and changed decision, a decision that might have turned out right and made it something else. Um, and I'm sure that this, there'll be a lot of discussion about why all of this makes the default so important. Uh, and I know it's a lot of responsibility to set defaults, but if you skip that responsibility and just force it on uh, the, you know, the, the workers who, you have to admit, if you're in the position where someone's asking you to pick the default, you probably know more about financial markets than the people you're picking the default for. So if you force them to do it, you know that that's not leading to, on average, better expected outcomes. Uh, this is a really tough thing. And I, I, I like many of us think that, uh, especially in the US, the switch from um, basically defined benefit plans to uh, defined contribution plans that pushed all of the responsibility for saving enough and for investing properly and, uh, and for getting lucky, you know, taking all the risk on the workers um, was not a good thing.